how free games trick you into spending money. Free to play games becoming pay to win. And free to play games. Free to play titles. Free to play. Pay to win. Paying to win in a video game. It's a pay to win model. Games didn't used to be this way. Back in the good old days, there were no loot boxes, battle passes, or microtransactions. Mm -hmm. Something changed though, and game companies switched from. I think for the most part, uh, it's mostly mobile games that are the pay to win games and most like. I don't know, single, double, triple A games, and maybe to some degree, like a good majority of indie games, they're not really free to play. I mean, or not free to play, uh, like pay to win or whatever. Um, yeah. The From play to win to pay to win. The socially accepted way of behaving in your game should be paying. But what's interesting yeah. is that in the beginning, almost every video game was pay to win. Back in the 70s and early 80s, you were most likely to find gamers at an arcade surrounded by the aroma of heated circuitry and musty carpet. And for those that can't imagine the smell or weren't around for the arcade days, games were different back then. You had to pay to play, but you also had to keep paying if you weren't good. You see, back then, uh, most arcade games used a life system, like Space Invaders. What a great thought. If you're not good, you need to pay. But if you are good, that single quarter can take you from beginning to end. God dang. Pac-Man or Time Crisis. And these games had only one goal, keep customers paying. They wanted people to fail because this mm -hmm. was how arcades made back their money on cabinets that could cost up to 10 grand. So with that in mind, it, it was always a thought in the game developer's head, at least at the time, where if the game was too easy, it wouldn't make a lot of money, but it, also couldn't be insanely hard because if it was too hard it also wouldn't make a lot of money so it had to find like some sort of gradient you know like a middle ground where it has to be hard enough but not too hard this is also why you'd see 30 people craning their neck to watch one guy for hours dumping quarter after quarter every few minutes as a teenager was pricey but with oh the rise God. of home gaming in the 80s and 90s arcades started dying off why when I grew up, I had no, like, arcades near me. It's so sad. I really wish I, I would have lived somewhere, like, with this kind of culture. It seemed, like, really cool, especially for, like, fighting games. Spend all your lunch money trying to beat Ninja Turtles when you could buy the game once and play it as much as you want. So with the demise of arcades, the pay-to-win model went into hiding. Like, the only arcades that were around me was, like, at the bowling alley. <laughs> and And just like you said, there's, like... Uh, there was like air hockey, ski ball, and a couple random like arcade machines. Like there was that punching, like it was like this weird punching arcade machine where you had like plastic mitts and like you picked them up or whatever. And it was like, uh, it was like VR before VR. You had these plastic mitts and you could like juke or whatever, like left and right. And then like punch or whatever. <laughs> I like, I tried that for, and it was like a dollar. So like if you're like putting if you're throwing down a dollar or like four quarters, that's like two games of like air hockey you're missing out on. So you need to like be good at this game or whatever. And man, I threw down a couple dollars in that game. And after a while, I was like, fuck this. This is garbage. <laughs> at least for a little while. What's crazy, though, is that the pay to win model would take almost 20 years to reappear. Needing yeah. free-to-play games, piracy, and League of Legends for it to come back bigger and badder than ever. But what's even more crazy is that it all started with Doom. There had never been something quite like Doom. It was massive, and it changed video games forever. Doom had top-of-the-line 3D graphics, there was a PC multiplayer, it supported mods, but most importantly, the game was free-to-play. You have to understand, this was insane to do back then. You didn't have free-to-play games. I Remember, everything was physical. You purchased games on floppy Sonic. disks. Or Bro, I, I had Sonic on, like, the Sega Genesis when I was younger, and I remember dying to that stupid water level every goddamn time it was so frustrating as a little kid you know like oh my god i had no idea and it was that that music that drowning music like or whatever oh my god i have nightmares about that hate that man or cartridges 
digital games weren't a thing. So free to play games weren't free to distribute, meaning id Software had to buy millions of floppy disks, then print Doom on millions of disks, then ship these disks around the world, spending hundreds of thousands before ever making a dime. So why would they do this? Well, back then developers were not the ones who made the most money off their games. Most of the money went to the publishers and developers often got single digit percentages and royalties. It didn't want to go this route. So they decided to try the free to play model known as shareware at the time. Using it before he pays for it. Mm -hmm. That's the wonderful thing about oh, shareware. Okay. Yeah. He actually has it in his hands and he sees if it's fit for his purpose mm -hmm. and if it isn't, he doesn't have to use it and doesn't have to pay for it. The goal was to get Doom Dang. in the hands of as many players as possible and hope they could upsell. A high risk, high reward strategy. For those confused on how shareware works, think of it like a phone game. Players only get access to the first few levels with the rest of the game being restricted behind a paywall. The goal is to get people hooked. And if they want to play the rest of the game, they need to call and pay for a code that I unlocks used to do that, the rest. A, candy crush. a little more convoluted than just adding your credit card. But the beauty of this model was that it would get 100% of the revenue instead Ooh. of splitting it with the publisher. It worked. Doom became a phenomenon. Companies were banning Doom from their networks because LAN games were clogging them up and slowing things down. I mean, really? the game had been installed on more computers worldwide than Microsoft's then new operating Dang. system, Windows 95. So because of the free to play model, it was able to upsell millions of copies, make tens of millions of dollars, and completely change the world of video games. However, it isn't among the modern gaming industry's Doom juggernauts. Is it. Why isn't the company still revolutionary? And why aren't people complaining about them like they do EA, Activision, and Ubisoft? There are a few yeah. reasons, such as the founding team breaking up or creating some disappointing sequels. However, the main reason is that id got comfortable. They were years ahead of their time with the free-to-play model, but they ignored the main reason for Doom's global success and released their following game, Doom 2, for $40 a piece. They completely forgot the power of the free-to-play model. And as a result, they stopped making free-to-play games. Slowly, the company fell apart. Oh so with the failure of id, the free-to-play model amongst major studios what? would disappear in the West, at least until the rise of League of Legends 16 years later. But in the meantime, new innovators would eventually find success, and it's all thanks to piracy. Why should I sail with any of you? Ooh. Four of you have tried to kill me in the past. One of you succeeded. The game piracy was a huge <laughs> problem in the 80s and 90s, oh, especially yeah. in Asia. Unlike most Western countries in Japan, many Asian countries didn't have piracy laws. There was nothing enforcing that $250,000 warning every time they popped in a VHS. So at the oh, time, 90% no. of all software in digital entertainment was pirated, which means if you were a game developer and you had a million people playing your game in certain parts of Asia, it was mm -hmm. likely that 900,000 of them didn't pay for it not a great way to make Dang. money but there were many not a great way to make money but an actual great way to have brain exposure many reasons for this cost of living differs greatly between countries oh I mean, yeah imagine paying 50 us dollars for a video game when your monthly salary is 200 bucks. So Western publishers yeah, did try selling games with prices that reflected the local cost of living, but pirates would just <laughs> travel to those countries, buy copies in bulk for huge discounts, and then sell these games in the States. And as I'm writing this, I remember going to a swap meet in 2005 and seeing Star Wars Battlefront, the first one, for like 20 bucks right after it came out. It was in mm -hmm. a janky looking case, but I didn't care the game was half the price that it was at GameStop. And I'm just realizing game. that it was probably purchased somewhere in Asia and shipped to that dinky swap meet for people like me to purchase. So we can see that the rampant piracy in Asia and the rise of the internet, up and coming <laughs> Asian publishers really needed to innovate to succeed. And the first company to do it was Nexon. Unsurprisingly, Nexon was a Korean company, one of the countries most affected by piracy, and they released the first digital free-to-play game called Quiz Quiz in 1999. This what? MMO set off a chain reaction, setting in motion a wave of Asian free-to-play games. Nexon had finally figured out how to monetize video games in Asia. I never played any of these games or whatever. Like, by the time I got a computer with, like, internet, I was going, I was like using those, uh, what was it? Those AOL discs where you got like, what was it like a month free of like internet or something? And like every time the little package in the mail that came, it was different every time. Like the AOL thing or whatever. And yeah, this was still at a, in a time where on the wall of the house, there was like a house cell phone, like a landline. 
<laughs> and every time uh, I booted up the computer and it hooked into the internet, you could you could hear it booting up on the phone. <laughs> and God forbid somebody called you. Because, you know, that just takes over the internet. You're just kicked off. And they didn't stop there. Nexon went on to create Maple Story, the first pay to win game in 2003, which Dang. was also the first game to feature loot boxes inspired by the real life gachapon toy dispensers. But while many Asian studios were innovating, the West continued as if nothing had changed, yep. selling physical games in retail stores. Because if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yep. But it was broken. The West may not have had as much rampant piracy as Asia, but I remember the good old days of Pirate Bay and LimeWire. Yep. You'd have a dedicated computer for all your games, music, and viruses. So the US still had piracy. Enough. You could download so much porn off of LimeWire. It was crazy. And you, you had to beware. You know, because you didn't know if you were getting, uh, like some video or it was like some virus you were just downloading onto your computer. <laughs> it was like the wild west. <laughs> that the music industry was actually failing in the 2000s because of it. That said, piracy wasn't the only problem with the Western status quo. You see, the industry was growing and companies wanted more people playing their games, but $50 price tags were keeping a lot of people out of the gaming market. So the other problem was price elasticity of demand. What the hell is even that? Basically, it's a way to measure demand for a game. So if the price of a game is $50, you can see only half the people who want to play a game will buy it. If the price okay. goes down, the player base will go up. So if you give your game away for free, you maximize your player base. Yes. But if you give your game away for free, oh you boy. need to make money elsewhere. Oh and boy. Western studios just couldn't wrap their mind around this concept yet. 570% value off of off of 99 cents wow man i'd be losing money if i didn't buy it <laughs> oh my god wait what does that say available in 54 months or minutes that's probably minutes yeah executives would sweat anytime they ever heard free to play and in business we call this an innovator's dilemma this is where league of legends comes in asia was popping out free games left and right and the companies making them were raking in the cash riot's founders brandon beck and mark merrill the creators of league of legends saw the free to play model working in asia and came mm -hmm. up with a genius plan they decided to create an optimized version of dota which at the time was a warcraft 3 custom game with yep. a massive player base me included they knew people loved the game, even though it was a janky experience. First, you had to purchase Warcraft 3, then you had to go to custom games and try to find a lobby featuring the Dota mod. Then when you finally found one, you could run to Taco Bell and back before the game even loaded. So Riot's founders knew they had a great gameplay loop they could optimize, but they also knew that League needed to be free to play. The founders took this idea of free to play Dota and with just a wireframe and a pitch, went mm -hmm. to investors. Some were confused, thinking players would never spend money on cosmetic purchases. Yep. Others, however, were blown away. Mitch oh Lasky, God. one of the first investors in Riot, put it this way. Bro, I, was, I have fallen victim to this many times in video games. Like, easily. I am, I am in no way, shape, or form like a saint about this. Like, if some of my boys are like dropping in to play Apex or whatever, um... And they got like some whatever skins on or heck even like the people like i'm just like solo queuing like if they got skins i'm gonna be like oh where'd you guys get that oh we bought it and you know me not knowing anything it's like oh let me go buy something i want to look cool and they understood not only the free-to-play concept but they understood how to bring an audience to the table to prime the pump of free to play. So yeah, prime the pump of free to play, AKA veterans of the game, uh, essentially just like showboating skins and cosmetics in front of new players, creating that want to look cool. So these investors didn't throw millions at Riot because the game looked good, but because Riot proved they knew how to make free to play work. Which is why League of Legends is one of the most pivotal games in history, for better or worse. So with League's success mm -hmm. and the introduction of free-to-play in the West, pay to win was right around the corner. Champions can fall, gods can bleed, where were you when the West rose up to conquer champions? 
One of my favorite experiences with pay to win happened a few years ago. I was visiting Yosemite when I overheard an elderly woman pleading with her husband to give her $3. I guess she had been struggling to be a Candy Crush level and needed to buy some gold bars to help her win. He muttered something under his breath, but he handed her his credit card. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This 70 year old woman was being manipulated by Candy Crush and based off the yeah. interaction with her husband. Yeah, it's not just kids being manipulated like adults that never played like conventional video games like pc games or console games like they'll 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 be like quote unquote gamers but they'll be like mobile gamers and since they're not like chronically like online or whatever like like regular people or no <laughs> like regular degenerates um they have no idea that they're being like manipulated into spending money in a video game like Candy Crush. They have no idea that this is even a thing. It wasn't the first time. In that moment, I realized that anybody could be swindled by pay to win mechanics. I mean, Candy Crush yes. at its peak was pulling in one to $3 million a day with in-app purchases. That's a lot of money. That's almost a billion dollars a year. This is what happens when you have companies that can manipulate you so well, you don't even notice when it's happening. And the worst part, they're teaching others their tricks. Yep. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. You know, it's gonna be yeah. a gnarly presentation when the guy starts with, let's not think about the morality of this. And yeah. he doesn't. This presentation on how to monetize free to play games really outlines everything in-depth industry secrets on how to use psychology to trick people to spend money the whole time watching this all i could think of was the old adage of the frog in the pot if you put a frog in the pot of boiling water it'll jump out but put the frog in cool water and gradually heat it up the frog will boil to death whereas the presenter puts it you hook the gamer first with something yep. irresistible then you create a habit with an easy and rewarding gameplay loop then pounce when the game becomes a hobby yep. because players will do anything to win yep. the longer a player plays a free-to-play game or whatever the more likely they are to spend money you know just like he said Gross. it's crazy to outright hear it but it gets even better top grossing games have in-game economies worth tens of thousands meaning the more players can spend on a game the more you'll make make stuff immediately useful, immediate gratification. So you don't want them thinking about the purchase. People yeah. are much more attached to the stuff they have than an equal amount of things that they can gain. We are more likely to pay if you threaten to take something away. So this is, we are herd animals, yeah. we tend to do what all, all of the others do. Absolutely do not want to tell them that the majority of people in your game never spend money. Yes. That's poison. Never tell them that. And never. My favorite of all, Make sure that your games aren't too skill-based. Yep. And this is like, I don't know. This is like, I, like I've seen this video that he's like referencing a lot. Um, it's like, I think this is like one of the reasons why games can't like, I don't know if they can't be, or they're just t like trending toward not being as skill-based as they once were. Granted, you know, I'm not looking forward to like, the next game that's as hard as like the old like battle toads or whatever where it's like damn near impossible to like just beat the game or whatever but like some sort of healthy gradient of like uh like checkers to like battle toad or some something you know like somewhere in between which is like what we're trying to like talk about and yeah essentially you can't make your, your games just like too skill based the craziest part about all of this is that what he's talking about isn't even the worst of it. It's yeah. terrible that game studios have taken these strategies and turned most free-to-play games into pay-to-win. But somehow, pay-to-win has also infected full-priced games too. You're not oh, only yeah. having to pay to play, but they want you to keep paying. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We seem to have come full circle. We are somehow back in the arcade days where I'm more likely to just watch someone else play because it's too expensive for me to keep up. Yeah. And I know that you know who really took this pay to win model to a new level. Yeah, and this is sad because as someone that was like raised more or less like on video games, it's like 
to see like one of my favorite hobbies being like bastardized is like completely heartbreaking. Like it, it's sad, you know? And it's like, and I try to think and it's like, has any other hobby like recreational hobby been bastardized as much as video games, you know, like just like playing and enjoying and consuming video games. Like, I don't know. The two time worst company. EA. EA saw all these free to play games using pay to win strategies and thought we could do better. At first glance, it didn't seem like a big deal. Like the cosmetics in Maple Story, who cares if someone wants to pay for a purely visual change? But over the years, loot boxes went from simple game additions to full on progression systems. And you know what's funny is like, the more and more I play video games, the less and less I care about looking cool in the game, playing the video game. And that's only something that, I don't know, I think you can learn, like, as you play a shitload of games or whatever, is like, you should learn to not give a shit about what you look like in the game. As long as you're having fun in the game, that's what matters, <laughs> ultimately. It's, you know, a, like, a lot of the times people will reference, like, back in the day, like, World of Warcraft, they'll get, like, an achievement or something or do something like really hard and then they get an item because they did something hard or whatever and then they'll go stand and post up on a bridge or like a mailbox and be like oh look at me i look really really badass you know or like back in like call it like old call of duty days like modern warfare 2 or something like that like all the gun camos where you had it was like get like a, a thousand headshots you get the gold camo get like 500 uh or 5,000, like, kills or something like that. Get, like, some camo. And th those days are just over, you know? A lot of, like, FPS games, it's like, you can't grind, like, for, for gun skins anymore. It's just pay. Pay money to look cool. Pay money for your gun to have a skin. That's just what it is. It was finally perfect in the eyes of EA. They were following the advice of a very moral presenter when he says, The reason I highlighted convenience over, up there or, or progress is that most of your sales will be here. Uh, customization, hats and stuff, they're nice, but you, you'll have a single digit percentage of your income coming from that. You mm -hmm. make the real money monetizing progression systems. And when most of your money comes from convenience mo and monetizing progress, there is an incentive for a video game developer to make the game inconvenient. You know, like if you're playing like some MMO or whatever, it's like, and it takes a long time to like just travel or whatever. Or like if you're building something in a game and there's that, like that timer, like you, you're at your little crafting station or whatever, and you put all the little materials in and it's like, okay, it's going to take a day to make, or you can spend real money and just speed it up and get it instantly like okay well there's no point for that timer to be there to begin with so it's it turns out to be just be pay for convenience not cosmetics so ea shipped this new model with their brand new game star wars battlefront 2 12 oh, yeah. years after i purchased the first battlefront game out of swap me i found myself reading article after article about battlefront 2 oh yeah when battlefront 2 came out at least you know like modern uh Battle, Battlefront 2, um, I, like, as I get older, I just tend to give a shit about games less and less on day one, because most of the time, the game has fucking bugs, it, it's dog shit, like, the servers are fucking swamped, it, it just plays bad, so I have learned to just, like, wait a week or two or something before you want to get, like, a new game, all right, fuck all that FOMO shit, you know, you're an adult, quit acting like a little kid, you know, <laughs> you know, relatively, you know, you're still playing fucking video games at 33. Come on. <laughs> but it like within that first week or two of uh battlefront two coming out, I was reading a lot of these articles he's talking about and more and more people <laughs> were referencing this one, like Reddit post where the dude did a bunch of math or whatever and figured out that 
it was going to take something like 10 plus years, or, or I think it was maybe more or something like that. 10 plus years to unlock all the heroes in Battlefront 2 with like regular play. And once he, he figured that out and he like released it, that article, it, it was it was all hell let loose on Battlefront 2 at the time. So much to the point where Battlefront 2 actually had to go in and change all their like pay to win bullshit mechanics or whatever to something a little more like feasible. So yeah, <laughs> it was just hilarious. Everyone's conclusion, the game was pay to win. People lost their minds. Oh yeah. Get four f planets! Controversies just won't stop coming. I would recommend not buying this game just because of the anti-consumer practices. EA tried to save face, but the backlash was immense. Oh, yep. So <laughs> this is the funniest fucking shit right here. The intent is to provide players with a uh, sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. Pride and accomplishment. Oh dang. Isn't I think this is like the most downvoted comment in like Reddit history. <laughs> oh man. EA back down. Loot box were grabbing the attention of governments. Was pay to win leaving AAA games? Were we finally free? Nope. Although we won against EA and loot boxes are disappearing, all sorts of games continue to hide pay to win mechanics in oh, yeah. games. So pay to win isn't going anywhere unless governments step in. So I think what's kind of more or less accepted is like if the franchise wasn't pay to win in the past and then the franchise tries to introduce some like pay to win bullshit in the future, then it's like the game franchise is like dead. You know, this is true for Battlefront. This is true for Halo. There's probably a couple more examples I can't think of, but that seems to be the case. Whereas if a game franchise is like free to play from the beginning or, you know, pay to win at the beginning and then it continues on to make installments or however the fuck it goes, it's like then it's accepted. Um, Yeah, which... It, it is what it is. <laughs> or studios find a more lucrative solution. Which brings me to my final piece. We need an ethical and lucrative solution to get rid of pay to win. Just like before with the introduction of- I mean, there kind of is and there kind of isn't. So I don't think there is a way to get rid of pay to win in games. You know, you know, people are trying to get like loot boxes and gambling out of there or whatever. I know like certain countries have like laws against loot boxes and whatnot or whatever. But I think like it, it as long as a game is like, if it, if a game wants to be like pay to win or whatever, it's like the game has to sell like an in-game item or something with a real world dollar amount attached to it. All right. So like if I want like a super powerful sword for like 30 bucks or 20 bucks or fuck it just like 60 bucks just for the sword the game is pay to win i want to be able to just drop 60 bucks you get that sword and just shit on everybody why is that better than the, all the current forms we have is because you can feel 60 dollars leave your bank account more easily than you paying 60 dollars to get like a thousand crystals and then converting those thousand crystals into like 10,000 coins and then paying like 8,000 coins. And then you get the sword because you have all these degrees of separation from the value of money that you just input in the game. And because of the so many degrees of separation, you have no idea. Or, well, you do have some idea, but like you're, it's like your mental connection to that money is just like, it's like way lessened and when it's way lessened you're more willing to put more money into the game you get what i'm saying so like yeah of the free-to-play model game studios are stuck and they do not know how to overcome it with inflation rising and costs soaring studios need to make more money on their games now more than ever before but like like the video says inflation is rising 
inflation is like increasing, but like all the pay to win games are like low effort to make, but high return. All right. So I'm not buying this whole concept of like games are harder to make and it's harder to make money from games or whatever. Like I'm just not buying it. <laughs> you know, if you want to make a mobile game, that's fine. And it's going to take you some amount of effort, but you want to compare that effort to making like a full blown, like 60 or $70 game. Don't tell me those are the same. You know, it's always going to be easier, way easier to make a mobile game than it is to make like, like a fully like flushed out, like, I don't know, 40 hour, like full campaign game. All right. That's I'm just not accepting that. And the whole thing with inflation is like, whatever, let's go. Let's keep watching. But they know if they raise the price of their games, they'll cut off large chunks of their player base, yeah. which is why it took so long to see games rise above $60. Yeah. But these game companies should also know if they keep going down this road of pay to win, they'll destroy their brand and future sales. Short term thinking is hindering their potential. The hybrid model trend and the excess of manipulative monetization strategies can't last forever. Gamers are starting to wise up. So these companies oh, are yeah. in a pickle. They need to think long term. Like me personally, like you can make whatever game you want. It you, you can do that. That's what's great. You can do whatever you want. You can make whatever game you want. I don't have to spend money on your game. If I don't like your game, it's as simple as that. That's all it takes. Vote with your time and your wallet. But don't know how. This is where true innovators shine. When you're in that pickle, you are forced to find creative solutions to unique problems. Those that don't will die or be bought by those that do. This is why League of Legends was so successful and why I'm so bullish on indie studios. When you're small, you have to innovate to succeed. And whoever mm -hmm. creates a great game that doesn't limit a game's value like pay to win, but adds value in a unique way will become like Doom in the 90s or League of Legends in the 2000s. There is a little asterisk, asterisk to this. It's like so many games are being built every single day. You know, it's hard to fucking innovate in a video game, all right? So I will give you that. I will give you that at minimum. It's really hard to impress and innovate nowadays, even with Unreal 5 or whatever, whatever engine you're using. A beloved game that changes the entire industry. As part of our tradition, we like to feature indie games at the end of our videos. And this time, our community chose the timeless free-to-play gem, Cave Story. Despite being released 19 years ago, Cave Story remains a pinnacle example of indie game development and has forever altered the perception of where exceptional games can originate from. We couldn't think of a more fitting choice to feature. You can play the game for free on PC or pick up a copy of the game on the Switch. I highly suggest it. And if you want to get oh, your okay. game or one of your favorite indie games highlighted, in our I next it. video come join our discord and let us know what game we should feature next this is a great video i love this i love this this little channel like going into you or whatever um it's just it just highlights um how exactly companies are trying to separate you from your money and all the practices that they use and it's not only kids they're trying to get money from it's fully grown adults 50, 60, 70, and plus, you know, their money is just as good. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I thought it was a great video. I liked it. I want to see more. All right. So that's pretty much it. All right. Later.